Oh, hello. How is everyone tonight? I am Edward O'Mara, or Ed. Everyone finds it weird when I say Edward. I only ever say Edward when I'm introducing myself on, on like videos and stuff. Um, I don't know why. I don't know why I feel the sudden need to be so formal, especially with you guys. You guys know me. I'm the least formal, least formal dude in the world. Um, but yeah, so you may notice, you may notice that there's no Erica on the stream tonight and her presence is sorely missed, but, uh, she, she's having to do real people stuff out in the world, um, over at the bank. I think, I think the money tried to escape the vault and she's having to hunt it down as one does. But that gives me a chance to talk about something I'm interested in. Um, so we're going to do some grain whiskey tonight. But first, who is in the chat? I'm noticing we're on a bit of a delay here. So I did a bunch of talking before I think the video actually cut in. That's StreamYard's fault, you guys. But um, I think I saw Wheels was in, Mark Goings on. Benjamin Eves. Hey, Benjamin. Um, Aladdin saying couldn't make it tonight. He's got to work, but he's going to watch the replay. Good on you, Aladdin. Um, and Mashing Drum, Miss Jason. Miss Jason was in. Um, so good to, good to see all of you. As always, what is everybody drinking tonight? Um, so I am going to be drinking some grain whiskeys tonight. Um, oh, hey, and Andrew Spirell is in. Yeah, I'm, I, it's weird. I'm getting a super long delay between StreamYard and the stream because I'm watching the stream over here and everything is coming in super, super late. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry if anything in the intro got cut off. People on the replay, apologies. Um, hey, Whiskey Straight L coming in from Ireland. Perfect timing, man. That's awesome. Uh, and Trev Wilson, one of our two moderators. Big thank you to him for moderating, because I know it's such a strenuous job on this channel. Um, and in fact, it's perfect that Al's in, because we do have, we're doing, well, we're going to be talking about two Irish whiskeys tonight, two Scotch whiskeys. Um, so talking about grain whiskey, I think everyone, most everyone knows what grain whiskey is kind of right but there's some intricacies that i think are lost on people simply because the focus well the focus right now is particularly on bourbon um and single malt right and single malt kind of had its heyday 90s into the 2000s and it's carrying on now now bourbon's having its its big moment um hey whiskey crusader will is in uh yeah so good to see you thank you for stopping by we love we love the whiskey crusaders so much um always a great stream over there i don't need to promote them they get like four times the numbers of viewers i do mm. but so i'm starting with the kill bagging tonight so let's talk about grain whiskey because i had to do some research for this one um and everyone knows like Aeneas Coffee, right? That's where grain whiskey, everyone knows Aeneas Coffee because he's like the guy who invented the column still. But that's not quite true. So if we're going back, oh yeah, everyone who gets in the chat, sound off, tell me what you're drinking, tell me what you're drinking. I want to hear, I want to hear, because we're going to talk about that. Um, but essentially, right, grain whiskey in Ireland, in Scotland, legally, it's any whiskey made from something other than malted barley. Um, in Ireland, there's also single pot still. So pot still whiskey can be 30% malted barley, 30% unmalted barley, and 5% other unmalted cereals. That used to be a lot more. Back in the day, like 1800s, 1700s, you were using up to like 20% rye, 20% oats. And then those uh, those evil bastards 
over at Irish Distillers and Pernod Ricard were, got in and leaned on the Irish government and said, hey, you guys should make pot still whiskey, basically what we're already making, make it easy on us. Um, so yeah, also Blackpool. Um, if you go to Blackpool Distilleries, they've got a great series talking about how Irish distillers completely effed up the definition of pot still whiskey. I will put that in the description after the stream. Uh, who else is in? My Bourbon Journey! Yay! Uh, Jeffrey Patron! Jeffrey Patron, we were just talking about how we were drinking your wood. We are sucking down your wood last stream. Yeah, your big stick. Um, he's on the Garyana, so there we go. Um, whiskey's on the Redbush. Whiskey Straight Isles on the Redbush and Dubliner 10. Oh, nice. I haven't actually had the Dubliner 10-year-old. Um, but yeah. So, but, okay. Grain whiskey. Basic idea. Unmalted, unmalted cereals along with malted barley. Malted barley was kind of the original mash bill, right? Um, but... The truth is that as soon as people kind of figured out that you could saccharify other grains using the enzymes from malted barley, people were making stuff out of other unmalted cereals very early on. Um, in fact, the in the Hebrides, the islands between Ireland and Scotland, people were making all types of different ishkabaha out of various different types of grains, kind of like catch as catch can. Um, it didn't really become a standardized thing until like, you know, 17, late 1700s, the Irish, the Irish were doing single pot still because they didn't want to pay malt taxes, right? And the English were saying, hey, you gotta, you gotta pay malt taxes. So the Irish were like, well, we're just, we're just not gonna use malt. We're just gonna use unmalted barley. It makes it taste spicier. That's kind of cool. And we don't have to pay your taxes. Um, but then, there was this guy. Oh, Whiskey Straight Out just posted the Dubliner 10 review. Nice. Nice. Okay. I'll go check that out after the stream. Um, oh, Benjamin Eves. That's actually something I want to get into, too. What is light whiskey versus grain whiskey? So here's, here's where we're going. We've established grain whiskey is just anything that isn't pure malt, right? So... Something like this, our boys over at George Dickel, right? This is a grain whiskey. It's a bourbon, um, but essentially by the Irish or Scottish definition, this is a grain whiskey. This is made with 51% corn and it's distilled in a column still, which most things in America are, right? So why do, is bourbon or gonna see whiskey in this case so full flavored and big and strong and meaty and grain whiskey from Scotland and Ireland has this reputation as being kind of light and effervescent and fruity. And Ben already kind of hinted at it, right? It really is how like the distillation proof, you know what I mean? So in America, if you want to call your thing bourbon, you can only distill uh, uh, your wash up to 80% alcohol. It has to be under 80% alcohol. Anything higher than 80% is now light whiskey, which basically means, I mean, it's light whiskey. It has light flavor. The idea being that if you keep it lower than 80%, you're going to retain more grain flavor. In Scotland, you can distill any whiskey you want up to 94.6%, or in Ireland, it's 94.8%. Um, which means that you're gonna get a lighter flavor in that new make, right? You're gonna have less congeners in the new make, um, simply because you have more alcohol and much, much less uh, grain, grain congeners. There's an idea of, like distillers are looking for a high alcohol to ester ratio. And when you distill something much higher, right? You're losing the esters, you're losing the congeners, and you're replacing them with alcohol. So something like this, you're going to have, when it comes off the still, you're going to have less alcohol, 
more congeners. Something like this, more alcohol, less congeners. Basic idea. Um, so then why, if this one, you know, this one's so robust and nice, I mean, these are basically the same ingredients, right? This is mostly corn. Um, this one is mostly corn. Um, so why do they, again, taste so different? I mean, it's partially distillation, but again, Kilbegan's different from most grain whiskeys, right? So Kilbegan is actually uh, only two, two times distilled. A lot of Irish whiskey is three times distilled. They originally started doing that because um, when they started putting unmalted cereals into the mash, they, were, they didn't have a high enough gravity to get the alcohol that they used to. Um, and so the simplest way to get around that was just, just to still it a third time. So you ended up at about the same alcohol by volume that you had before, starting with a lower gravity mash. Um, in today's world, that doesn't really matter anymore because we have uh, uh, natural enzymes that we can add to the mash. Um, Ben says he's got to put the hell into bed. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the other thing now is that Kilbegan, Irish grain whiskey doesn't have to be aged in uh, new oak, right? So it's a colder climate. You're not using as active oak. And, you know, you've got a relatively light spirit in the first place. So you're coming out with a relatively light product. Um, as opposed to this, where you're putting it in new oak, so you're getting a lot of that heavy tannin, uh, a lot of that lactone, a lot of that vanillin straight off the barrel. This is using used bourbon barrels, so a lot of that tannin, a lot of those lactones have been leached out of the wood already. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the difference. So basically, most of the whiskey made in America is in fact grain whiskey. It's just that we don't call it it because we we call it specific things. We call it bourbon. We call it rye. We call it wheat whiskey. We call it uh, whatever else. That's that's kind of the difference. Um, and like so, if if the Irish were to take a whiskey like Kilbegan, only two times distilled, which is something I need to figure out, is as I'm wondering if it's only two times distilled because they're running it through a column and then a doubler which is basically a tiny pot still, and that constitutes two times distilled for a column distillation. Um, I'm not sure about that. But were they to take this and put it in new oak and give it a lot of time, you may eventually, with a lot of time, come up with something kind of like our good friend Dickel here. Um, it's not going to be exact because you're taking more time to get it there. Uh, Okay, but yeah, so <clears throat> early, early to mid 1800s, people are looking for more efficient ways to, uh, to make whiskey. And it all really starts with this guy here. His name is, uh, oh, I'm going to mess it up. No, it's Saint. No, not Saint. Sir, Sir Arthur Perrier. Um, he's a man of French Huguenot extraction living in Cork. He was the um, distiller at Spring Lane Distillery. And he comes up with this idea for continuous distillation. He's the one who, who patents one of the first continuous dis, uh, stills in Europe. And it looks a little something like this. So this isn't the best picture because it's kind of hard to tell what the hell's going on. Um, but the basic idea is those ribs in the middle there are actually concentric circles forming a labyrinth in, in the pot still. So it's actually forming this labyrinth in the pot still that the, the dis or, or the wash has to find its way through. So it comes in one side and then slowly follows these concentric rings, turning the corners, with the idea being that as it goes through, the higher, more, uh, 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 you know, the higher alcohols are gonna evaporate upwards going through that pipe at the top. And then 
the water and the uh, oils and all that are going to come out the bottom into the, the waste tube. So this is really like, this is the first attempt at a continuous still. And some people call this the first continuous still ever created. Um, some people disagree and call this like a semi-continuous still um, because it's not quite as efficient as the ones that come later. You still have the issue that not all of the whiskey is actually getting refluxed. Um, it's just a small portion because it's running around these little concentric circles in this labyrinth. So parts of it are heating up and they're, they're going to a very high alcohol. Well, other parts of it aren't being exposed to that much heat. Um, hey, Dustin says rib for your pleasure. Rib for our pleasure. Yeah. Got to put those ribs down your throat. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Whiskey Crusader Will says good info so far. All right. I'll, I'm glad because this is, this is a far cry from our usual jokey bullshit. I know, I know. So if anyone if anyone came here expecting penis jokes for an hour, I'm sorry. Uh, also, this Kilbegan is pretty damn good. Um, I've heard a lot of people compare grain whiskey to, as like sparkly, like sparkly sweet. That is not what's going on here. This one's a little bit more dark sugar, a little bit more caramely maybe touch a coconut and it actually, the finish is like marzipan. It's like that really thick marzipan that people like sculpt things out of on cakes. If you've ever had that. Um, so it's like, it's sweet, but it's not quite super sweet. So, yeah. And I think that's partially due to the double distillation rather than the triple. The double distillation is going to leave more of those congeners in there to interact with those lactones and those tannins, um, which is going to create more of those interesting kind of sweet flavors rather than just straight up across the board sparkly. Um, Dustin says he can fill in the penis jokes. Yeah. Um, uh, Whiskey Den says we're fitting in a few penis jokes here and there. Yeah, I try. I try. Okay. But now, so Perrier comes up with a continuous still. It's pretty good. It's not bad, right? It's, it's okay. Um, it's not as efficient as it could be. It still gets gummed up and you got to go in and clean it. So it's not like as continuous as it could be, but it's, it's like, it's a very, very much more efficient than like doing triple distillation, which is what the Irish were doing at that point. Um, which of course, if you're doing triple distillation, you've got to clean out that pot still, not once, not twice, but three times before you can get to the next batch, which is obviously intensive work and waste man hours. And like Victorian times, they were probably all burning their hands off and shit because they didn't have safety practices. Kind of like that guy at Lafroy who fell into the mash tun. Um, but then comes along a Scotsman named Robert Stein. And I don't have a picture of Robert Stein. It was really hard to find a picture of him, but he comes up with the patent still, which is kind of what, which is, it's about as close to the still. It's very close to what Aeneas coffee made with a couple, a couple things that made it not quite as efficient. But he comes up with the first one. And it's actually a brilliant idea. So you're actually running it through two columns, right? And this is still very much how we do it today. There hasn't been too much change over the centuries. Or centuries. It's like a century in and in a change now. Yeah. Um, but the idea being, you've got your wash coming in the first column through a pipe, right? Which is your rectifier. I wonder if I can point to where that is over here it's this one the one on this side that's the rectifier so what you're doing is you're actually putting your uh, wash in through there and the wash is going through there because it's cold right so as it descends through there bop, 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 there's actually uh, uh, high alcohols rising through there and we'll get to where they came from in a second and that warms your wash so that by the time it gets through that pipe and over to the analyzer, it's already warmed up a little bit. Now, when it gets to the analyzer, which is 
this one. Bop, 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 bop. It's falling down this way through the analyzer. Bop, 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 bop. And there are little bubble plates that separate each of the things. So these are actually tiny raised bubbles. You can't see my hands. Tiny raised bubbles on each of the plates. With the idea being there's a pipe going down and the wash runs through there and it hits the plate and it spreads out across the plate. And then it starts to heat up because there's steam being shot up the pipe, right? So you can see that over here. Yeah, so number two, number two, the little, little pipe down there. There's steam is going up, wash is coming down, right? So as the steam goes up, it crosses paths with the wash, bop, 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 and the alcohols get stripped out of the wash a lot by the steam. And every time it hits a plate, those the wash condenses against the plate and boggles around like a little motherfucker. And that's reflux, right? So the basic idea is you're putting a, a solid in the way of the thing. So it condenses a little bit. It jumps around like a motherfucker. All those heavy oils and congeners and all the bullshit you don't want falls away. And that gets, uh, uh, it goes down into the wastewater at the bottom. So if you look at the bottom there, number three, the little purple tube, all the wastewater is going down there. And the volatile components are going up to make your whiskey. Um, and that happens over and over again. So it's like having a bunch of pots stacked on top of each other. It's like if you took a pot still and a pot still and a pot still and then boom, 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 over and over and over again. So with this, you can actually get it up to 95, 96%, which is actually an azeotropic solution. Basically means you can't make it any more alcoholic than that. Um, unless you did azeotropic distillation, that's a whole different fucking thing. Um, hmm. So, right. So now you've got that. It's run, your, your wash has gotten to the top of the analyzer. Now it heads back to the rectifier. And the rectifier has another series of solid plates that this thing runs up through with little openings so that the steam can go up. And because there's cool wash running down the rectifier, it cools off a little bit of that whiskey at every plate. And so there's whiskey condensing at every plate. And then the more volatile elements bop around, bop, 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 and then continue on up. So depending on where you put your condenser, right? If I put my condenser down here, I'm gonna get like the stuff that's like 40% alcohol. If I put my condenser up here, I'm gonna get the stuff that's like 60% alcohol. If I put my condenser up here, then I'm gonna get my stuff that's 95, 96% alcohol, right? And so basically where you take off your distillate from the column, that decides like how many congeners are going to be in there, um, what the alcohol, what the alcohol content is going to be, how like rough or smooth or whatever um, your, your whiskey is going to end up being. Um, which, to be fair, is a lot more, it's a, it's a lot easier than doing a pot still, to be fair. And then again, Pot stills are getting more automated these days. However, this is still easier because you can put your condenser wherever you want it. And you'll know that you, if, as long as you put in the same wash with the same alcohol content, you're going to get a consistent product every time. Um, <laughs> Dustin just says it sounds like a condom. <laughs> yeah, you got to keep the little, the little crazy guys in there. Can't let the little crazies out. Um, and the fun part about this, the fun part about this, okay, check this out. So on the top of the rectifier, number six there, uh, thank you. I think this was Still Cooker who made this diagram. Thank you to him because it's awesome. If you look there, number six, that's actually where all your super volatile crap is coming out. So all the stuff you don't want to drink, the stuff that's poison, is popping out the top there, which is a lot of fun. because, And that's how, you know, they make vodka. If you... In America, anyway. American vodka is tasteless, you know, odorless bullshit. So, but you want to make sure you get it up as high as you can, the highest alcohol possible, 
without having anything that's going to poison somebody. You know, you don't want to have those really super volatile alcohols in there. And so there's a little spot at the top that the volatile stuff just goes shooting out of. You collect that, you add it to your feints, you can run it again. Make sure you get all the alcohol out of there. <sighs> so yeah, so that was Robert Stein. Robert Stein comes up with that. And he goes around and he starts trying to sell this to all the Scotch producers and all the Irish producers. And he does a shit job of it. Nobody, nobody will give him money for it. Um, and the Irish especially hate it. The Irish don't consider this whiskey. They think it's complete bullshit. Um, but there's, there's one Irishman who watches one of these demonstrations, a man named Aeneas Coffey. This guy right there. <laughs> so Aeneas Coffey is an excise man. He sees one of these one of these things and he's like hey that doesn't sound so hard i can make this he adds a couple tubes in the uh columns so that they uh there's more time for the uh alcohol to reflux and you know get nice and light but basically what he does is he sells this motherfucker um he's the one who really gets this this grain whiskey thing a rolling and obviously, that pisses a bunch of people off. I'm going to pour something next. So this is Teeling Single Grain. Everybody loves Teeling. Um, so this is their five-year-old Single Grain. This was their 2015 edition. 46% uh, alcohol aged in X wine casks. So this was um, Cooley. This was Jack Teeling worked for Cooley before he went out on his own. He took a bunch of Cooley stock with him. Oh, also Kilbegan is Cooley as well. So these are both Cooley products we're having right now. Um, Kilbegan, they can't, their column still is so tall that they can't actually fit it in the Kilbegan distillery. So they have to make it at Cooley. Uh -huh. I love dealing though. See, the Kilbegan is actually much more sharp. It's a little bit more, a little bit more spicy. This is just so mellow and sweet. Um, it's just, it's, it's not like a candy sweet. It's not excessively sweet, um, but it's got those lovely, most lovely grapey notes, like kind of a, 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 a jam thing going on with a little vanilla, a little caramel. Um, hey, Malton in Montreal. Swami. How you doing, Swami? Mm. Yeah, that's just so good. That's just so good. It's just so good. It doesn't taste... Um, it doesn't taste sparkly or, or or like unrefined. It's it's just like banana pudding with a little bit of berries, with some vanilla, just a hint of wood spice. Really good stuff. Um, but yeah, so Aeneas Coffee pissed a lot of people off, particularly his fellow Irishmen. Um, because the Irish were very, very committed to the pot still, right? They were very committed to single pot still whiskey in particular. That was, I mean, up until like the Irish whiskey industry completely fucking collapsed and fell apart, single pot whiskey was, or pot still whiskey was the, you know, it was the defining Irish style. And Aeneas Coffee kind of, Fucked that all up for him because the Scottish got super interested in this right away. Um, the Scottish saw this and blending had started around the same time. Originally, people were blending single malts, right? You think about guys like Johnny Walker, uh, Buchanan, Dewars. You know, they started blending single malts because they could make a more consistent product. And then 
you had them get interested in grain whiskey. Oh, what's this new thing? You're making like so much whiskey all the time. It's great. Um, you can make whiskey just willy nilly, no big deal. And people started having grain whiskey and they were like, well, hey, this is this is lighter. This is smoother. This is less obnoxious and and painful to drink. And, you know, I think at that time, the tastes were changing to go into this lighter style. And of course, that's where blends came from. So blended whiskey, like our good friend Johnny Walker, Song of Ice over here, right? They really started, I mean, they took off, particularly in the 1890s, and the Irish crowd cried foul. They were pissed off about this because they were like, well, fuck you for one, and fuck you for two, but mostly, how the hell do you think you can call that whiskey? Um, you know, there's no, there's no art to it. There's no, there's no work to it. Um, basically, what you're doing is you're, you're, it's a factory now. It's, it's the industrial revolution came to whiskey um, and they got clobbered in the market. They, they absolutely did because people started blending single grain and single malt, making blended whiskey and people loved that shit. Like it was just flavorful enough to, to be fun, but smooth enough that it didn't make you feel like you drank Epicac, you know? So that's good. Me, though, I prefer it one way or the other. And obviously, nowadays, everyone's into malt. I love malt whiskey, but there's something really nice about just plain old grain whiskey. That blended whiskey kind of fucks up. You know what I mean? Like, if you're if you you somehow take two things that are pretty good on their own and you put them together and you fuck them to death. That's kind of that's kind of how I feel about blended whiskey. Not all blended whiskey, but quite a bit of it. All right, so that brings us to the modern day shit, because that is that is just about as far away as you can get from like the wee pot still, the 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 Ishkabaha making making gales out on the hillside with their wee pots trying to hide from the excise man by cover of nightfall on a windy windy night. Um, this is actually one of the column stills at North British. So there's a few there's a few um, grain whiskeys uh, distilleries that are still around. If I'm trying to remember all of them right now, North British, Invergordon, Port Dundas is closed, Carsbridge is closed. I'm trying to remember who else is around. You know what? I'm just gonna look it up real quick. So I can give you some accurate information. Yeah. Okay. Cameron Bridge, North British, Invergordon, Strathclyde, Girvan, Loch Lomond, and Starlaw are all making grain whiskey in Scotland. And then obviously the big guys in Ireland, so Middleton, Bushmills, Cooley, um, they're all making uh, column still whiskey right now. So what's the difference there? What is the difference between Irish grain whiskey? and scotch grain whiskey, because there is a difference, funnily enough. So, because if you look at the technical file, right? Um, uh, hey, Ben's back. Uh, yeah, no, grain whiskey, right? I feel that way too, Al. I really like, um, I don't know, there's something, there's something really pleasantly light and, and lovely about grain whiskey. I feel like it's a very summertime whiskey, which is funny that we're doing in the uh, dead of winter. Uh, Strathcombe, I don't know if Strathcombe is one. Do you mean Strathclyde? Because that was that's in Glasgow. Um, but there's a few that are actually in this bottle of Compass Box right here. This is Compass Box Hedonism um, that are actually closed now. Um, so they're actually taking really old stock of grain whiskey and blending it together. So if I remember correctly, there's Port Dundas in here. They actually, from batch to batch, it varies a little bit. Um, because I know Port Dundas was in here. I think Carsbridge was in here. 
um, Invergordon and North British. And most of this is actually Rechard and First Rechard Oak and First Bill Bourbon, which is uh, pretty damn good. Which that is the thing we need to talk about. Okay, so for, okay, first things first, difference between Irish and Scotch grain whiskey. Let's talk about that. So one thing there, I mean, they're similar in that you can't use, you can't just use malted barley, right? Except you can when it's in Scotland. If you, if you put malted barley into a column still, it suddenly becomes grain whiskey, right? Um, however, in Ireland, you have to be using both a column still and at least 70% unmalted cereals. So if you put unmalted cereals, for example, Kilbegan rye, which I gave my bottle away because I'm an idiot, but Kilbegan rye is made with 20% rye, but it's made in a pot still, right? Which in the 1800s, you could have called that single pot still whiskey. Again, until Middleton fucked that up for everybody. Um, but because it wasn't made in a column still, you can't call that Irish grain whiskey. Um, Malton Montreal says he just had the Red Breast 21 this past weekend. It was pretty good, but wasn't wild. I agree. I like the 12 cast strength. And honestly, I don't think over oaking does great things for Red Breast. I think it's I think it's pretty great at twelve at cast strength. Um, wheels, you I think because it's actually I don't, they don't tell you on the bottle. You kind of have to guess which batch you got. I don't even know if they tell you which batch on the bottle. Um, yeah, unfortunately. Oh wait, no, there is a wee date on here. So this is the two thousand sixteen release. I could probably figure that out real quick, actually. Um, but yeah, so, but here's the thing. There are some people in Scotland right now who are doing rye whiskey or whiskey made with some amount of rye. I know Brooke Laddie's doing it. I think there's like seven different distilleries who are doing something with rye. Um, and they're putting partially malted barley partially rye whiskey into a pot still, right? And they're called and they call that grain scotch whiskey. In Ireland, you can't do that. In Ireland, if it goes in a pot still, but it's not pot still whiskey and it's not single malt, and then you just have to call it undifferentiated Irish whiskey. I don't know. It's a funny thing about that. Um let's see about this hedonism real quick, because I have the computer here. I might as well figure out what the 2016 batch was uh if i can let's take a peek hey but yeah so patrick fuller's in i'm sorry patrick i didn't see you there good to see you man um and then whiskey straight out says he got a 30 year old single grain from strathclyde he really liked nice i do have to finish out the night i do have a north british 30 year old right here so that is something i saved from the advent calendar last year that's been sitting in the closet because i didn't have the heart to drink it but we're gonna kill it tonight um Whiskey Straight Al says, yeah, red breast cast strength. Yeah, about as good as it gets. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I really don't think you have to pay for the 15 or the 21. I really don't. Um, but yeah, so let's talk about this. Because both of these actually do something different. A lot of the grain whiskey that you're getting in your blends, I'm looking at you, Johnny Walker, you bastards. Um, a lot of that is aged for the minimum three years. And then uh, it is put into like a really, like a dead cask, a really inactive cask, like, you know, maybe refilled for the third time. Um, hey, ADHD whiskey. Good to see you, buddy. How you doing? 
Um, yeah. And oh, Mark's asking which day this is. This is 23. This was day 23. Wow. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, so if you if you actually use good casks, if you use active casks, right? So in this case, we used wine casks. In this case, we're using um, Rechard and uh, First Fill Bourbon casks. If you use those good casks, you actually get more wood uh, effect in your final product than you would with a whiskey distilled to a lower proof. And this is actually Davin de Kergamil talks about a lot in his book on Canadian whiskey, which if you haven't read it, I know I shit on Canada all the time. Davin de Kergamil is the best thing to ever come out of Canada, um, except for like, I don't know, Letterkenny. But those two things, those two things were good Canadian things. Um, but he talks about this. So the idea with uh, taking, when you have high, a lot of grain congeners, in your whiskey, right? You have a lot of interaction between those congeners in the whiskey and the congeners in the wood as they take it on. I mean, this is a, I mean, there's a process of microoxidation where these compounds change slowly over time, creating new complex flavors, especially those um, fatty acids and your high alcohols, your high acid, your high acidic stuff. Uh, <laughs> so he says, fuck you. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Um, but yeah, so if you take, if you have something with a lot of congeners, uh, they will create esters over time as they mix with wood congeners, right? Basic idea. Hey, Matt from Whiskey Crusaders in. Love you. Um, hey, and Mr. Townsend is in. Good to see you, man. You just came in in time to hear me slag off Canada. So that's fun. Um, <laughs> but if you've got fewer grain congeners in there, right? Um, because you distill to a higher proof, as in the case of these, I mean, this one was probably taken up close to 90%. Uh, as with this one, I guess this had to be around 93, 94, which is close to vodka, right? But not close enough that there's not gonna be grain flavor. Those couple points of, of uh, uh, proof make a big difference. Even, even fractions of percentages make a big difference in the amount of congeners in there compared to actual neutral grain spirits. Um, <laughs> he says he heard. Um, but what Davin de Kurgan is talking about is that if you take something very highly distilled and then you proof it down, so you take something, you distill it up to 90%, you proof it down, right, to 60, 62 range, uh, and then you put it in the barrel, you're actually going to gain a ton more of those barrel notes, those sweet flavors, those vanillins. You're going to get really interesting fruity notes. You're going to get stuff um, that you wouldn't necessarily find had you not distilled up and then proofed down, um, which is really a shame that grain whiskey has this uh, uh, reputation as being just light and uncomplex and bullshit. Because if if grain whiskey producers were using, you know, using their wood properly, ah, got to use your wood properly. Um, if you if they were using proper wood, active wood, wood that would contribute some flavors to the distillate, right? They could come up with some really cool, weird shit that you wouldn't find with something that had all those grain congeners in it. Case in point, this is Compass Box. So I did look this up. Let's see, where is it? Um, I did look this up. So let's see if we have what this was. Okay, so unfortunately, they don't have the 2016 batting on here. I think this is the 2016. Let me make sure. I can't tell if that's a 2016 or 2018. It's hard to tell. Looks like a six. Anyway, um, but the 2018 batting was actually so 38% Invergordon from Rechard American Barrels. 
uh, 29% recharge Hogshead from Port Dundas, which is cool because that's no longer open. 23% Cameron Bridge, first fill American. Uh, 7% North British recharge and 3% first fill from North British. So that's some, that's, that's pretty decent wood. I want that wood. I want that wood in my mouth, right? So I will say, comparing this to Teeling, the Teeling is much more rich molassesy. It's got like a, that bittersweet molasses smell. This is this is very lightly vanilla, like poached pear maybe, kind of like a cooked pear. A little bit of tangerine. Uh, touch of touch of that spicy graininess, not a lot, right? This is still pretty light. This is, there's not like a whole bunch of kick to this. Mm. But that is so good. That is so good. It's just so goddamn good. It reminds me of uh, if you take all the different flavors of popsicles and you mush them together in a blender. That's kind of what this is. <laughs> so you've got a little bit of sweet lime. You've got a little bit of uh, a cherryness. Um, there's this interesting kind of pineapple thing that I would imagine comes from the first fill uh, bourbon. Um, yeah, it's pretty freaking good. Um, and it takes you on a little journey because, and Erica and I were actually drinking this before, before, and hopefully I'll have her on. We'll do a full review on this one. Um, me and her, maybe, maybe that'll come out this week. I don't know. Whenever we get a chance. Um, but it actually finishes on this really interesting note. She actually compared it to a smoky note. I don't know if I get smoke necessarily, but it does have uh, this touch, this touch of kind of astringent dryingness on the finish um, that reminds me more of like a full, like a full on malt whiskey. A lot of those young grain whiskeys that were done in inactive casks, they finish with this weird kind of screwy funk, this sweet funk. Um, this one doesn't finish like that. This one finishes with just a little bit of bite just at the end. So it doesn't finish too sweet. You know, it's just got just enough to boop, crisply finish off the, finish off the drink. Um, Whiskey Crusaders asks, have you had stolen whiskey 11 year single grain? I had the 11 year. I don't know if that was the single grain. Is there, are there two 11 years? Because I'm not sure if I've had that one. Because I definitely had a stolen whiskey 11 years. 11 year. Um, still in Canada says he tried a sugar vodka wash in wood and only a woodpecker would enjoy it. <laughs> um, which is actually a fun, a fun thing. So I actually have right here. This is Leu Grand. Um, this is a French oak. Oh, you can't see that. The old ring's messing it up. Sorry. Trust me, it says Leu Grand. Um, this is a French oak finished vodka. I mean, so obviously the difference here was that they took this up to 95-ish percent rather than stopping at 94.8 or whatever. Um, so this is nothing but French oak flavor, um, which is a difference you actually see in the Eastern Bloc countries. Rather than trying to make the most neutral vodka they can, like Russians and Ukrainians and Polish, they'll actually take it up to similar to grain whiskey levels, like 94-ish, 93-ish, um, to retain some of that flavor. Gives it a little bit more of that grain kick. So it's actually closer to this. Uh, ben says he just polished off the eggnog from Christmas after dinner. Nice. <laughs> we had, oh, uh, what, what is it called? Oh man, I'm totally forgetting. My coworker is Puerto Rican and he got us the Puerto Rican eggnog, which I cannot remember the name of right now. It's fantastic though. Um, yeah, no, so, and that's the thing, like 
if you if you do have you can over oak things right i mean that's that's something you deal with so you don't want to just put a grain whiskey in for three years in the in the fucking boiler room and and try to just get that thing over oaked because that's not going to taste good well unless you're a texas whiskey fan i take that back i take that back because that's a little bit different if you're a texas whiskey fan you might like that um but yeah so Let's get into, so this is the North British aged 30 years. The cast type was sherry butt. Um, so let's take a peek at that. See, these are all very different. All, all four of these have been quite different. Because this one, this one you do get kind of a sulfury woody note on. I mean, it's 30 years in the cask. Oh, yeah. That is, it doesn't have as much fruitiness. It doesn't have as much like raisininess as other sherry butt flavored things it's still pretty light but you get like this it's like sulfur meets brown mustard kind of thing and i dig it i dig it mm. Mm. there we go on the taste that's where the sherry sun shines oh god damn and that's what i'm talking about if you take your time and you put your shit in a good barrel for for long enough, you're going to come out with just a tiny bit of graininess, and then you're going to get that big blast of whatever the barrel is contributing. That is fantastic. Like, it's not it's not as oily, sulfury as Macallan, like, or, or something like that, or Glendronic, or anything like that. Um, but it's it's still, it's it's got those wonderful raisin flavors. It's dried apricot. It's... Um, of it's spicy with just a little bit of clove. It's it's got this uh, uh, boiled fruit tart thing going on. A little bit of breadiness. It's awesome. It's fantastic. Uh, and Mark Goings on says he already drank all of his. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's the funny thing. The nose on this one doesn't really. Like, you get a little bit of that, but not as much on the taste. It just shines on the taste. It's really, really fantastic. Um, so, that's it's, this is my thing. I feel like people need to give, uh, pick up that lot 40, and just before you sip it, think wood, and that is all you will taste. This lot 40? The regular one or the, the 2012 we just reviewed? Because this is pretty woody. It is pretty damn woody. Like that is that is a tannic motherfucker. It's not as tannic as as a, like a lot of bourbons I've run into, but yeah. It's still got that rye spice, the kind of it's not pickly, but it's black licorice y, peachy kind of thing. Um yeah. So that is grain whiskey. Grain whiskey, uh, it isn't. It isn't just for blends, you know. And honestly, I think blends do it a disservice. That's that's my takeaway from this: is malt whiskey is awesome, grain whiskey is awesome. Blends can go suck a dick. <laughs> uh, I mean, and that's that's just talking about like Ireland and Scotland. We're not getting into bourbon and rye and all that Canadian stuff. Um, but yeah, my opinion, I'm a man of extremes. If you're going to do malt, make it that big, strong maltiness. If you're going to do grain, give me that nice, light graininess. I love it. Um, but give it a little time in the cask because you're, you're going to make some cool stuff. These are all great whiskeys. All, all of these, um, the Kilbane tastes a little young compared to the other ones. I'll be honest, but nonetheless, these all kick butt. Um, in their own way. And I feel like as a, 
as malt crazy and as bourbon crazy as everyone is right now, like we ought to be giving these more of a chance. Um, so yeah. Mr. Townsend says he just did an Eagle rare mash bill. Uh, and it's fantastic in the white dog. Also add wood to it. Nice. That sounds good. I would love to taste some of your stuff as soon as I get the opportunity. Um, because yeah, I would, I would, I'd have to make it up to Canada sometime, but just isn't too hard. I can make that happen. Oh, also everyone, uh, you gotta go check out still in Canada because they just had their official opening and they had a big live stream. I'm pretty sure that I missed because I was working because everything is terrible, but that's okay. So, all right, I'm going to finish out, uh, first things first. I'm going to put a little bit of all of these together. Get a little blend going because that's what we do here on the Rock Up Review. Um, I feel like Eric is actually going to be mad she missed this one. Because she, she usually has to drink something terrible in the blend. And, uh, oh, it's this Saturday. Oh, I still work, though. Dang. Dang. Uh, yeah, this actually makes it smell more apple -y, interestingly enough. Apple-y and brown sugary, which is funny because I don't think I got that in any of those individually. Hmm. Oh, yeah, that's good. That's good. That's real good. Okay. Oh, get away from me. Okay, I get off at 9, so I'll run home as fast as I can and make sure – Make sure we uh, I can get on there. So we're going to finish this off as tradition dictates with a pull of the chicken cock straight from the neck, um, which is still technically a grain whiskey in, in the most technical sense of the word. And until next time, thank you all for joining. On your way out, make sure you hit the like button. I hope you enjoyed the stream. Uh, and if you haven't subbed already, why not? Give us a sub, hey? And until next time, you guys... Stay rotten.